Um, this is our second Beta or Bike NYC City Bike NYC event. Uh, apps, maps, and hacks. Um, we the very first event that we had was not too far from here, uh, and we, it was essentially the first hack night to kind of take a look at some of the city bike data. But that ended up growing into an apps presentation. Uh, this is the the third apps presentation that we've gone through, but technically our formally our second one. So uh, I love I hope you love the nuances uh, that we're going to be going through. But feel free to tweet with Bike NYC. Um, at, at City Bike NYC, um, we want to make sure that as many people who are fans of cycling in New York City and fans of City Bike are hearing about the different apps, maps, and hacks that you're going to be um, uh, introduced to this evening. Um, the greatest thanks that I have to give is, is to the Rudin Center uh, who and uh, Open Plans, and I think Frank is still on his way up. Uh, but the Rudin Center and Open Plans, nope, Frank is still down over there. Code for America is the third sponsor of the event. We're just, uh, we sponsor, Code for America sponsors Beta NYC. Beta NYC is the New York City Civic Hackers. Um, but for now, I'm gonna turn this over to Sarah to really kind of give a larger framing of the event. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Thanks Noel for the intro and for organizing it and for in general motivating the Bike NYC community. Um, Welcome to the Rudin Center. If anyone here is new to the Rudin Center, we hold, hold events and conduct research on the most topical issues in transportation in urban areas. So we have a lot of great projects right now. Um, the most exciting thing is our mobility fact book. You can take a card on your way out if you haven't already, where we cover the uh, 27 modes of transportation in New York City and how people get around using them. Um, so that's at nycmobility.org. And the fact, uh, fact book cards have factoids on the back of them, so collect them all. Um, <laughs> so we are thrilled to have you here tonight. We're going to showcase some interesting uses of city bike data. We're thrilled to have Danny Simons here who represents City Bike and is a wonderful person who you should only ask the most friendly and astute <laughs> questions to. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Yep. Is that right? No. Yep. So uh, we're gonna move on to Danny Simons from Malta Bike Share slash New York City Bike Share slash City Bike. So while Nell's giving, getting the presentation set up, I just want to say for those of you guys who are in the room who are maybe students at NYU or just earlier on in your careers, I'm like looking around this room and feeling really excited because I realized that like I met Sarah when she and I were both working for city or quasi-governmental agencies and both had a passion for open data and kind of bringing that, um, bringing that to agencies that were kind of slow moving to adopt some of those things. And I met Nolf through some of that. And um, Frank, who I don't think he's losing, I don't know. Anyway, I don't think he's losing his hair that much. Um, but I've known these folks for a long time and you realize when you're in the same career in New York for a long time, you'll know people for a while. So you should meet good people and keep knowing them. Um, I also see Neil Friedman in the back there who's probably trying to hide and maybe embarrassed, but he is amazing and worked with me at New York City DOT. And um, Noah is in the back uh, over there and he works with us now at New York City Bike Share as one of our outreach ambassadors and is a really awesome guy as well and has been associated with NYU as well. So um, it's kind of amazing to see all these different worlds colliding in one place. But I'm going to get down to it because there's more interesting people than me to talk tonight. So. Um, my name is Danny Simons. I'm the Director of Marketing and External Affairs for New York City Bike Share. You might wonder why I care about data or hacking. Um, I'm a recovering scientist who somehow accidentally got into marketing and um, so I find all sorts of data fascinating. For those of you who have been hiding under a rock for the last year, this is <laughs> my company. We are the operator of City Bike. We are not actually owned by Citibank. Citibank does not come in and run the bikes every day. They are a sponsor. MasterCard is another sponsor. Um, we are based in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. So if I ever say, I'm not sure if I can meet you in 10 minutes for a meeting, it's because I am all the way down near Bay Ridge. 
We are owned by Alta Bicycle Share, so I work for a company that's a subsidiary of Alta Bicycle Share. Um, Alta runs the systems in Boston, DC, San Francisco, Chicago, also lovely Chattanooga and Columbus as well. Our system uh, contains 332 bikes, uh, 332 stations, 6,000 bikes. Uh, we're south of 59th Street, um, so if you take a loop in Central Park, please cut across the 79th Street Traverse to avoid getting overtime fees, and also in Brooklyn. <laughs> We are contractors to the New York City Department of Transportation. The bike share system has been a huge success, and here is some data to prove it. Uh, we have about 107,000 annual members. We've had about 425,000 casual members. During peak days, we see about 36,000 trips per day. Yeah, kids. Chicago put out a press release this weekend. They had a record-breaking day on Sunday, Memorial Day weekend. They had 16,000 trips. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> we had 16,000 trips on a day in January. Just saying. Um, the bikes are becoming part of the city's fabric, and areas that are not covered are demanding bike share. So we get emails on a daily basis from people in Queens, in Harlem, in the Bronx, even in Staten Island, which is surprising even to me. Um, I'm going to go pretty quickly through this because I don't have very much time and I want to sort of let you guys get to the point, but we do have a bunch of education outreach programs which I thought I'd bring up tonight because I feel like we haven't been talking about it that much and I just want people to know that we are really trying to use City Bike to encourage new people to um, try out bicycling in New York City um, and it's sort of an untold story, but um, we have discount programs for New York City housing um, residents. We have discounts for community development credit union members, which is to encourage people who uh, might not have been banked before to get banked to be able to get um, access to city bike. We have a lot of education classes. We have city bike street skills classes nearly on a weekly basis. Um, and that is in a partnership with Bike New York, who's been an amazing nonprofit partner for us. And um, hey, Bike New York. Um, so if any of you guys have been thinking about trying city bike, but have been kind of nervous about riding in the streets of New York, that's a great opportunity. And we have some job training programs as well. Um, you know, maybe some of this stuff is totally obvious to you guys, but I just want you to know that we actually use data ourselves <laughs> in our own operations. Um, and just to highlight a few of the ways we use data, many, many ways. We are constantly monitoring station conditions. We can see on our dashboards if a station has, we call them stale heartbeats, which basically means we haven't heard back from a station. We ping it. We don't hear back from it. We don't hear it reporting any sort of data to us. So we know something is going on with that station. It might be that the station needs a reboot, much like a computer. It's just frozen or crashed for some reason. It might be that um, the batteries have gotten low and there's not enough sun to power the solar to back it up. Um, but we know that it means we need to send a station tech out there to, to look at the station and fix it. We look at ridership patterns, and um, I'll show you in a minute how we use that to help um, do a better job of rebalancing. We track lost and stolen bikes, so if we see a bike that's out for more than 12 hours, we give that member a call. <laughs> You'll get a call from our friendly customer service people being like, hi, how are you? We think we might have a bike out and you might want to return that because actually there's a time limit and you might be in charge for that. Um, we track maintenance orders and we track um, bike repairs so we can know sort of the productivity of people in our shops. Our finance team obviously uses a ton of data. It's no different than any other business. We use data to figure out how much cash is coming in, how much cash we expect to be coming in, to set budgets for the year, and to do planning. Uh, we help provide our data to make the system more usable to customers through our City Bike app and station map, which we are constantly trying to improve. In fact, we sent out an intern two weeks ago to do a real live count of the bike availability and the dock availability in stations and compare that to the app to make sure that we're actually validating and doing some ground truthing on that data to make sure that it's accurate and up to date. Uh, on the membership side, which um, falls under me, I use it to track annual member signups. We pull data so we can send actual physical mailings that welcome um, people to the program and send them their keys. Uh, we use it to email our annual members on a regular basis. We send renewal reminders and track um, uh, renewals as well. And we also use it to track um, the ridership of our annual members um, so that we can understand, um, much like a gym, like if you don't ever come to the gym, you're probably not going to renew your gym membership. If you come to the gym very, very often, you have become a very expensive gym customer, um, which I love because, you know, I think it's important that people ride a lot, but our operations team just wants to know what the story is and how much people are really using the bikes so we can figure out, well, what does that mean for our next year's budget and forecasting how much we're going to need to spend on maintenance for the bikes. 
We use the data for transparency and storytelling, so we provide a lot of system data on our website, citybikenyc.com slash system data, which I'm sure all of you guys are very familiar with that page. We highlight the stats on our blog, our Facebook page, our Twitter. We produce some cool infographics, and our partners produce even cooler infographics, some of which will be shown off tonight. Um, and we use it in our press releases. It's been a huge part of the storytelling about the success of the system to use the statistics and the data about the system to show and demonstrate very clearly that the program has been well used and a huge success. This is an example of an infographic that was created actually by our sponsors at Citibank to celebrate our first anniversary, which was yesterday. Thank you very much. Um, interestingly enough, and maybe boring to you, but when I first saw this graphic, it said that there were 40,000 bikes and that the furthest distance between two stations was 26 miles, <laughs> which I think just shows that people in banks weren't necessarily riding bikes that much. It might seem like 26 miles from Hell's Kitchen to Beds Die if you don't ride very often, but in fact, it is less than 10. <laughs> Um, <laughs> our biggest operational challenge is definitely rebalancing. How many people here are city bike members? How many of you guys have experienced a situation where you've looked for a bike or a parking space and not been able to find? Okay, yeah, let's think about equal. Um, and it's, it's definitely something that we try to use data to address. So we've actually worked with a team of data scientists from Cornell University and we're continuing to work with them. Um, they do both data and operations and they've helped us develop some models and there's a couple of different versions of this but this one's pretty cool it actually shows um, what the rebalancing needs will be um, at this station this was approaching rush hour at east 40th and 5th avenue and it says the fill level is 90 percent um, that means that we need to get the fill level back up to 90 percent because there's going to be a high demand for bikes there there were currently nine bikes there and 44 docks empty so we know that we have to send um, a rebalancing crew there to bring bikes there for that for that period to get it ready for rush hour um, that helps us a lot because before in the very beginning when we launched we would see oh that station's empty we should send a truck there now <laughs> which is not a good way to do things in new york city because the traffic is horrible especially at rush hour which is when all the stations either go super empty or super full and it would just be a nightmare trying to get people around and we would be sort of like you know chasing the tail instead of actually ahead of the problem and so now we can actually have learned from a year's worth of data okay these stations are always empty at this time these stations are always full at this time and so if you ever look at like maybe like 3 or 4 p.m. and you see like all the stations in the East Village suddenly empty, that's because our rebalancing trucks have just gone there and pulled bikes out of there because we know in about an hour or two those stations are going to fill up like crazy as everyone commutes home to the East Village. We have two staging areas now um, for our um, rebalancing crews. We use the Farley building which is um, near Penn Station and we have a lot on Delancey Street that we can use <coughs> And we can basically store tons of bikes there and rush bikes into Penn Station because the demand is pretty much endless there. It's like feeding the beast that is never satisfied. <laughs> um, and we can pull bikes out of the Lower East Side um, and then we can take those at night when the traffic is less to all the stations that need them without having to take them all the way back to Sunset Park all the time. Um, we've purchased, uh, we're in the process of purchasing or leasing more box trucks um, and getting rid of some of our sprinter vans, which are smaller. The box trucks can ha um, handle more bikes at once, which is great for our really heavy areas like near Penn Station, near Port Authority, near Grand Central. And we um, realized that the sprinter vehicles were just getting stuck in traffic. So you might as well just dump a lot of bikes in one place and then we are implementing a system where we can rebalance by bike. And so you'll see some bikes out now that look like the ones um, on the lower left, um, that they can move some bikes. We're actually getting um, tricycles that can move somewhere between six and eight bikes at a time. Um, those hopefully will be on the streets soon. We are training people how to use them so we make sure that they're safe and well-trained before they go out in the streets. Um, but the theory behind that is that you'll find that like one avenue is totally empty and then one avenue is completely full. And so moving bikes by bike actually helps navigate through that congested traffic a little more easily than moving a box truck or a sprinter would. What other data do we use? Um, in the very beginning, um, for those of you guys who are new to New York or just weren't around at the beginning of this program, 
the New York City DOT actually used a whole, um, they did a whole community outreach process, which was like meetings with actual real people in rooms, but they also had this really cool map online where even if you didn't feel like coming to a meeting with a hundred other crazy people, because there wasn't like nice cocktails and cheese in the back, um, <laughs> they, um, they had a map where you could actually vote on city bike station locations. And it was um, actually open plans helped develop that. So I give, now Frank is back in the room so we can no longer make fun of him. Um, but now we celebrate him in open plans um, and helped come up with this map design and people could plus one and put comments on what other people had already submitted on the map and it was very cool and so that was very important in the choosing of locations and also the validation of a lot of the research that DOT and the Department of City Planning had already done to show that yes, citizens sort of say the same thing that intuitively government bureaucrats thought was smart. Um, we look at the calls and emails that we get to try to figure out, you know, detect large scale trends of like, whoa, what are our customers unhappy about? Or like, oh, maybe there's an issue because our call volumes just spiked like exponentially and we can see like, oh, maybe something is actually going on just based on like the fact that all of a sudden our call center is flooded and our call center uh, actually works about 30 feet away from me. So they're not like in some far distant place. Um, so it's pretty easy to tell. I can hear the, the noise level increase outside and I come out of my office and I say, is something happening today? Is something going wrong? Uh, we look at Twitter and Facebook chatter. Um, you see down here, um, Shmuley, is Shmuley in the room tonight? I think Shmuley is actually like a data geek himself. Um, any people report in lost and stolen bikes to us through Twitter and Facebook, and we do try to actually go and retrieve them. Um, if the bikes are in motion, it's a little harder, but this one was locked inside a building in Crown Heights, so we were able to go and try to get that one. Um, we also use bike map and safety data. That's actually really great in storytelling for this program. Um, and I actually use this as a message when we're talking to people who are considering using the system with casual passes. Like, it's never been a greater time to bike in New York City. It's getting safer than ever. Ridership is increasing. Um, the risk involved in bicycling is decreasing. And, you know, I think that's sort of the number one thing that I've heard all year. Like, oh, I would do that, but it seems really dangerous. I'm like, no, it's not. the data shows. It's not, it's not nearly as dangerous as you think. So I know that I'm going way over. So um, just quickly, what's next? Um, improvements to the app. Uh, we've added a refresh button, which is, I think uh, a great improvement and we're also making quarterly updates so we can keep track as um, iOS uh, issues ever uh, ever increasing iterations of the iOS um, versions. We can keep track of that and make sure the app does not crash with the new versions. Um, we are thinking about and planning on adding richer information for casual users. These icon, these um, infographics are inspired, infor, the photos are inspired by actually students who did an amazing project with us this winter um, from the School for Visual Arts. And I think two of them are speaking later tonight, I hope. Um, and they gave a lot of awesome suggestions just based on their experiences, interaction designers and graphic designers about ways that we could do a better job communicating with our casual users because um, even as annual members are a learning curve for this program, but you're using the system every day, so you kind of climb that curve. People who are using the system casually are using it for a day, maybe a week, and we want to make sure that like right away it feels like, oh, I can do that, I get that. Um, we are improving the information we provide at the station. We have outreach ambassadors like Noah, who is a returning outreach ambassador for the second year. Um, and we have folks basically stationed at some of our highest use stations um, all week and especially during the weekends and the warmer months to just explain to people and be a human face for the program. A little further down the road, we are exploring the idea of having keys for casual users, which is something that um, DC and London already do. Um, we are actually using a different version of operating software than they do, so it's not like a just do what they do kind of situation, but um, we are looking into ways that we can make that happen for us. And I think really um, bike share, there's been so many innovations in bike share in terms of the bikes and the station design. And there's like papers you can Google if you're really into that. And I feel like even presentations at TRB about like the four generations of bike share that have gone on. But no one's really innovated that much on the payment system. Um, payment at the kiosk has sort of been how it has been all along. And I think that there's a lot to be done on that front. And we are really excited to try to do some pioneering work on that. Um, it's uh, it's sometimes when you work in a program and you have all these different operational concerns pressing on you every day, you're like, this is going so slow. And you're like, everyone thinks like, why can't you just do that like that? And I get frustrated too. I'm like, why can't we just have mobile payment now? But it's definitely on our list of improvements to come. Expansion, everyone always asks about this. So I thought I'd just put in a slide. Uh, we do not have a timeline yet. I know, I know, I know. 
Um, the first phase of the expansion would likely cover Williamsburg, Green, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, and Long Island City. Those were the areas that we were supposed to be at um, when Hurricane Sandy hit. It damaged and destroyed a lot of our equipment, so we had to scale back our original service area. Further expansions would likely include the Upper East and the West Sides, Crown Heights, and parts of Park Slope. Um, and we've heard strong demand from Red Hook, Gowanus, and Astoria. And you know, since the program launched, we've had a change of mayoral administrations and. To a large extent, we will also be, you know, at at the service of the new administration in terms of thinking about where to expand and working with them on what their priorities are as well for where to take the program next. I would be remiss to not to point out that we do have a city bike data challenge in Big Apps this year. Um, we have a challenge that would allow city bike users to plan a better trip by predicting bike and dock availability. So much like right now on the app, you can open it up and see how many bikes and docks are available. If you're sitting in a bar somewhere and you're like kind of thinking about maybe leaving, but you're not like quite ready to leave and you look, you could go to that dock and then there could be no bikes there and that would kind of suck. But then, you know, um, so if there was an app that allowed you to kind of see what's the likelihood if I leave in half an hour that I would get a bike, that could be really cool. Um, so that's the website for more information about that. And I just want to say a huge thanks again to Noel and Sarah and Frank for inviting me here today. And thank you, all of you, for being here and being interested. And I look forward to hearing what all the presenters have to say. So we're going to have Aaron and Jeff Rizzocco come up and uh, talk a little bit about a, a marriage made in uh, City by Cac Nights. <laughs> Uh, Alex, sorry. Um, and while they get that set up, uh, for, don't worry, that's just me moving this and making a loud noise. Okay, for those of you standing in the back, there are chairs that are kind of available. We've got two over here in the front. We've got, oh, okay, we've got two that are here. So come on, come on down uh, or not. But um, if there is an open chair, if you just happen to casually put a bag, something on the chair next to you, just if you could uh, uh, alleviate the space or maybe scoot in to somebody who uh, probably rode a bicycle here, may not be smelling so good, but that's all right. Um, they're uh, saving the environment for riding a bicycle. Um, all right. Uh, sometimes I tell really bad jokes that I fear will be on the internet later and that will be attributed to me. So uh, watch out. Um, it's true. All right. <laughs> Hi. I'm Jeff Rizzocco. I'm Alex Joswood. And we're going to talk a little bit about some data exploration we, we are doing um, kind of in the background, just on the weekends, I think, right? Uh, about a month ago, we both spoke at Beta NYC about two different projects we, we had done. Uh, Alex did this map, which I'll let you explain. Oh, sure. Um, I looked at likely routes between, between all stations for all rides and tried to see if bike lanes uh, covered the existing demand for city bike users. And uh, with Rudin Center, I did uh, this visualization that um, has been, it was kind of an opening gauntlet into the, uh, the release of the data where we didn't route at all. And so a lot of conversations about routing came up. And one of the reasons we kind of chose not to do routing was um, just because we had a short time period. But I was questioning how many people actually took, like we, there's no GPS on the, on the data, so you can't really predict where the routing is. Uh, and I also saw a lot of salmoning. Um, on my my, uh, my 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 street on Second what is Avenue. Uh, hold on, get to that. Okay. Uh, so um, <coughs> we did a bunch of. Uh, actually, I'm going to skip over this part. Um, so this is salmoning. Salmon. This is a salmon going up a river, and it's a, a metaphor for people riding the wrong way on a street, which we've all seen a lot. I sit at this cafe on Second Avenue, and I watch probably five an hour go the wrong way, and it's it's kind of dangerous. Just to be clear, um, Bike Snob NYC invented this term, and he wanted me, I had to pay him $10 for saying it out loud. So um, this is me catching two people salmoning on 2nd Avenue today. One guy's parked, fixing his bike. The, uh, another guy's just kind of right about to run into him. And there were like 10 people coming the other direction. So it's not very safe. It's really, really unsafe. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and Alec Baldwin ran into the police with it last week, so um, it's, if it ends up in In Touch magazine, you know it's a bad idea. So we kind of got curious about what if we could find them in the data, because we found a lot of other things in the data. We found Sarah and I found hookups, we found um, families riding around, we found commuters, but salmoning is, is what we really wanted to focus on. So 
Alex and I started looking at like how could you possibly discover people riding the wrong way when you don't actually see them and you just see their trips. So we identified two sets of bike lanes that were pretty solid. Um, first and Second Avenue. Um, first goes this way, second goes this way, and then eighth and ninth, the same thing. So the arrows are here, so you can see that. So, um, and I sit on second and I see people going north on second all the time. Um, and just as an example, if you wanted to figure out why, like what the, the situation would be, someone would start on ninth and be going to another station on ninth, uh, and they would need to go on eighth to be on a bike lane, but if they didn't want to do that, they wanted to just go straight, that would be, they would obviously have taken just a direct route and gone the wrong way on the street. So uh, we pulled the data and started looking at it and we realized at some point that the, the crucial part of each trip is going to be just crossing the blocks. And one thing we did discover was that 8th and ninth are wider than 1st and 2nd, which I did not know that that happened. I, I, it's, it's, yeah, anyway. So um, we picked 8th and 9th because it was, it's a little wider and um, there was a little bit more room to, to see the difference. So what we're, we were looking for is um, a small group of people in the data that were just like somewhat faster than the rest of them. <laughs> and so Alex did some amazing work. I'm gonna let sure. you yeah. go into it. Uh, so what we did is we said, right, there might be a group of people who are essentially breaking the law, going, going the wrong way in the street, and they might be much faster than everybody else. So we looked at um, pairs of station on the same avenue and tried to see if there were any um, any instances of this, and what we found is seven pairs of stations, like uh, this one between uh, St. Mark's Place on 2nd Avenue and 39th Street on 2nd Avenue. Um, these are, this zero is basically the mean uh, ride time for this station pair. So, you know, you see generally like um, people kind of centered around the mean, um, but there's actually this group of people who exist like pretty far below the mean. Um, <laughs> we think that might be a, a, a sample of people sampling. We actually um, just kind of, you know, maybe we were seeing something different. Maybe this is like a completely different age group. So we looked at um, just kind of some basic demographic things like age and uh, gender. And it doesn't seem, it, it's not like these are all young males in their 20s. Um, it's, it's a little bit less um, clear than that. So, And this is very much an unfinished project. So we're actually just kind of starting this, but we have some, but this is an exploration of the data. Um, and then we also did the same thing on ninth. Uh, so you can see, so there's these, these patterns, this pattern keeps showing up, and so one of the things we're going to do is keep taking apart these little clusters and um, figuring out what they're doing. We're looking at, we're going to look at time and, what else are we looking at? Time of day, gender, age, essentially, yeah. the other kind of information you can see. Maybe, I mean, maybe it's also just happening late at night. Um, we, we don't know, we don't know exactly when it's happening or who it is. Peter Pesha. Is there odometer readings in the data? No. No, there's, um, there's a duration, so it's time, elapsed time, that's what we're showing here, um, but there's no, there's no actual distance. Yeah, we're pretty much doing the whole thing on the duration of the trip uh, and the location of the station, so, and trying to figure out what that is. So, um, that's it. We, um, so if you want to find us on Twitter, we're, we'll keep posting what we're doing, and we'll, we'll, as we find out more, we'll, we'll get up there. Great. So for those of you who uh, don't know the different, there's, there's really just a handful of data sets that people have had access to over the, the last year. Um, and the one that they used is the trip data, which was most recently uh, released, what, two months ago? Two, three months ago? Yeah, two months ago. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the things that we like to explore in the City Bike Hack Nights, or the Bike NYC Hack Nights, is get proficiency around the data, uh, you know, be able to understand it, see its anomalies, and then try to incorporate that into other insights. Uh, speaking about insights, um, we have Ben from iQuant NY. Correct? That's yes. right. Excellent. Um, if you've been reading Gothamist, uh, if you've been following the NYC Open Data hashtags, uh, you've been seeing his charts and, and, and kind of uh, interesting insights in New York City Open Data. So this is the first time that we've met. Um, you're going to have, I forgot to tell everybody, you're going to have eight minutes. Uh, and then you're going to hear a, yeah, a crying cat. So uh, uh, give me one second. I have to wait? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> All right. All right.
Go. Hi everyone. As you said, I'm Ben Wellington. Uh, I teach statistics to urban planners at Pratt, um, specifically around open data, so to make it very relevant to planners. You're going to learn about numbers throughout the textbook, take all the New York City open data, and learn statistics around data. So I took that project um, and made it into a blog, which has become iQuant NY, as was mentioned. Um, on iQuant NY, I look at all sorts of open data sets. I found the hydrant that was uh, most profitable for the city, exposed it, and the DOT is repainting it. Uh, I heard the work order went in last week. So I'm saving, it turns out I underestimated here, I'm saving New Yorkers about fit between two hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year thanks to open data. Yeah, open data, all right. Uh, I looked, showed that uh, there's some great inflation going on in restaurant inspection scores, but today, today, I'm talking about city bike mapping. This is a map that um, I put up this week. That's a single bike. This is the busiest city bike in the entire system, at least for the data they released. The numbers here, they're hard to see, but uh, the darker it is, the more often that bike was at a station. So that one bike in the data they released went to, I think it was 83% of all the stations. Um, I'm not talking about this bike today, I'm talking about mapping in general. I wanna show how easy it is to make a map like this. And hopefully I can do it in, in my seven minutes left. So uh, I'm gonna show you the tools I use, something called Beaker, which is, I don't know who uh, is a data nerd here, but it's kind of like iPython. Um, and I use mapping in QGIS, which is free. So anyone can download, all this stuff is free. Anyone can download it. Um, uh, Beaker, like I said, is, is a notebook. It lets you to play with data, but you can do Python and R and uh, HTML, Groovy, all these things all in one notebook so you can switch between languages. Maybe you think that's cool, probably not. <laughs> but I figured I would mention it. So um, I'm gonna give you the quick demo here of how, I, how you would go about, um, let's see, let's zoom out on this because it turned out. All right, cool. So uh, basically, uh, I'm gonna show you some lines of code that are basically all I did to make these maps. Here I'm just reading in, um, they've decided to, to, to post a one month file, City Bike, I know that which means a lot of studies are like interestingly on one month of data. <laughs> I wonder if they had released weekly files if we'd see studies on weeks data, but you can actually put them all together into a single data set, which is cool. So um, the data, for those who asked earlier, has things like trip duration, start time. Uh, we could scroll over, there's gender, there's uh, uh, the station names, things like that. So the age of the, the, age of the rider. So, um, sorry, I went too far. So, uh, so let's load that, so now I have to reload this. So um, once you have, this is gonna take a little bit because I just accidentally went back, so give me a second. This is the phone with live demos, but I, something always goes wrong. Um, the, give this a second. So yeah, so my, my, my point here is, uh, is going to be that there's like maybe 15 lines of code in this whole thing. It's gonna set us all up um, and we'll go from there. So there's the raw data. Here I'm basically running, this is grouping by station ID and outputting the longitude and latitude of each station ID. So that's starting to see uh, a station ID and longitude and latitude. Lastly, I dump that to a CSV file. And so now I now have a file with every station, longitude, latitude, step one. Step two, we're gonna look at, in this particular case, I'll look at gender. So um, this is saying I'm gonna take my start station IDs, I'm gonna take gender, and I'm gonna look at the count of the genders for each start station. So it's just a few lines. Um, this, I, I will, if you email me, I will, I'm gonna post a link to this on the web so you can actually see the code. But uh, it takes maybe about, there we go. So for every station, we now have the number of males, which is, in, is one, in, in, and females, which is two. Last step is uh, uh, just add, doing a ratio. So uh, here I'm adding, I have gender now, I have my percent for each station, that's male and female. And uh, I'm just gonna dump that to CSV. And I'm done with the coding portion. I'm going to show you now what to do in this program called GIS. Uh, GIS is mapping software. Um, so I've pre-downloaded a few things. So one are the CSVs that is created. Here is a file which is from uh, the New York City Department of City Planning. That you might recognize this fair landmass here. Uh, if you don't, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, also import what we just created in that last step. So here I'm going to import the station list, okay? So I import it, and now we've mapped stations. Just like that, there they are. It's cool, because GIS chooses a random color. You never know what color you're gonna get. <laughs> this is an awesome color scheme, I'm excited. <laughs> um, the next we're going to, uh, you know, it's fun to see dots, but I, I like to do things in, as you saw, they were sort of in these polygons. So this is something, I don't know how to, uh, my pronunciation is off, but something called uh, uh, Veronoi polygons, maybe. Veronoi. Thank you, Veronoi, I told you it was off. Um, so, uh, ah, all right, so 
Here I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna build polygons around each and every one of those dots. Um, and so now, if we reorder this, you'll be able to see what this does. For each dot, I now have the area around it in the city that's closest to that dot. So now we have a map of districts closest to each city bike, okay? Lastly, this doesn't look very much like New York, sadly. So we're gonna do a quick um, uh, clip. So I'm gonna basically merge the Department of City Planning uh, data. So I have my diagram, Department of City Planning. We're going to merge it. Um, and hit OK. It takes a second to process, which is funny because this seems like the easy part, just clipping. Give it a second. And what we have out is basically a map of city bike. Hopefully this works. Cool. So let me undo all the other ones. Look at that. We have a map of city bike New York. Cool. So we're almost done. The last question is how do we start putting interesting data into here? Uh, so in that case, I'm going to take what we uh, created before, which was this um, percent mail CSV file. And you could do this, by the way, you can create this percent mail CSV file in, in, in GIS itself. You can do it in Excel if you know how to use pivot tables. It doesn't really matter. I happen to use Python here, but there's no reason you have to. I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to basically uh, merge it onto, uh, onto my data. So I'm going to say, okay, I have my percent mail, and I'm going to join it. Hit, hit OK. And lastly, so now this map, you can't see it. Underneath it has all the percent mail. And last, I'm going to do graduated. I'm going to pick my my mail, my uh, obligatory color scheme, which I guess is pink and blue. There we go. Or should I do a gradient? There, this one's good. Classify, hit OK. Uh, hold on, sorry, that was the wrong field. Percent mail is what we wanted. That was station ID. <laughs> Not as interesting. All right, so what we have is now a map of the city bike stations with gender percentages. Um, and you're gonna hear some awesome analysis by Sarah on this kind of thing in a minute. But uh, uh, you know, you see sort of this Brooklyn is, has more female riders, Midtown is more male riders. Um, and you're gonna hear you know, some thoughts on that, some cool, really, really cool work. But this talk's not about that, it's just saying, okay, we can make all sorts of maps now super quickly <coughs> just by changing that one column of data. So for example, um, for example, here is a uh, percent late night weekend riders. This is, a, this is a nightlife map of New York as seen through the eyes of City Bike. We all learned that the Lower East Side has a lot of nightlife as does the Meatpacking District. Uh, and holy cow, Williamsburg is a station where 5.5% of all rides are between midnight and 4 a.m. on weekends, which is an astoundingly high, I don't know, I think that's a lot. One in 20 rides is on weekends at between midnight and 4 a.m. Um, you can look at, uh, uh, this is the median age of rider. This is fascinating. Uh, here in the, in the East Village is the youngest riders, and just down here in the Lower East Side, all the way by the river, are the oldest riders. Um, I'm not going to make any claims as to why it is, but you can think about it. Uh oh, finishing up. I got 10 seconds left. Percent non, the percent non annual riders. This is called the uh, percent, percent non annual, is, uh, these are basically tourists mostly. They're on, the, they're on the rivers, right? We see the tourists, they're also exploring Brooklyn. But notice all the tourists are on the, on the sides. And lastly, um, the number of seconds each ride is. So we can see, once again, people on the rivers take longer rides. Not surprising. I don't know why you might care about that, but it's there. Um, so if you're interested in doing this kind of thing, there's a, website, there's a company, Boundless Geo. They just profiled this kind of work, and they actually have a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, walkthrough of how you do something like that. So if you're interested, go to boundlessgeo.com and go to the blog, and you'll see a, de a demo. So thanks to, obviously, uh, Open Plans and, and uh, Sarah and Noel for having, having me here. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, check out iQuantNY, my Twitter, iQuantNY. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry about the cat over there. So for, uh, does anybody want to give a band a quick question while we reset to different laptops here? Yes. You got to yell it out.
Yeah, it's, it's something interesting. I mean, I can't comment on, I guess, you know, we have or other people have to comment on what they're thinking. Uh, I will say that from the map, um, I mean, one thing that bothers me most about the New York City bike share, with all due respect, is the lack of stations on the Hudson River itself. And I understand there's all sorts of problems because Hudson River Park is a private blah, 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 blah. Um, but, you know, as a, when I've gone to other cities and biked, uh, when I, uh, in, in, you know, I biked along the river. That's where I would go when I was a tourist. And so I imagine that if they wanted to up it, they'd have to figure out how to get the state, based on that map at least, they'd probably want to get stations over on the river. But I'm sure they have all sorts of logistical nightmares that I, I have no idea about, and that's probably preventing it from happening. And I recognize that, but I don't know. But yeah, uh, something to think about: longer rides. You know, that, that's not in this data here, so I can't comment on it. But it's an interesting thought. So thank you. Oh, great. More questions to come now. Sarah Kaufman. Hi, I'm back, and I'm here to talk about city bike and pantaloons: a gender story. Um, this is a. a discussion of using city bike data that has to do with gender. So um, let's, let's begin. Uh, in an, a recent analysis of city bikes gendered rides, um, that is the rides that indicate gender, um, which are only subscriber rides, not single use rides. Um, I found that more than 76% of rides are taken by men. And that's why the woman is little there. <laughs> More specifically, in this beautiful map designed by Jeff Rizoka, um, there are stations that are overwhelmingly preferred by men or women. Um, we tried to oppose the gender norms, sorry Ben, uh, and we picked the top male stations are orange and the top female stations are blue. Um, and by top, uh, I mean that the most trips started from those stations by percentage so of the gender. So, um, but the top female stations are only up to 39%, and that the most, most equal station is Avenue D and East 8th Street. Um, you'll notice, uh, in general, male, male stations are in Midtown and female stations are in Brooklyn or have easy access to Brooklyn. Uh, in general, if you're, if you're gonna summarize it, there's the male bike rider and there's the female bike rider on the Greenway. Um, thank you, Flickr, for these images. Um, but if you look more closely at these stations, these 10 stations that are the top ones for each gender, there are some pretty interesting characteristics. Aside from women preferring Brooklyn and men preferring Manhattan, um, women slightly more opt for stations on streets that have bike lanes, just a bit more. Um, they, on average, the streets have less traffic. They have less, far less truck traffic. And um, I looked at recent uh, crash statistics. So in the year of March 2013 to February 2014, there were fewer cyclist injuries on the streets that women chose, which um, does have to do with traffic levels, but also has to do with kind of a cultural memory of, oh, I saw something really nasty happen there. I am not biking there. Um, so how do we change the ratio? And why should we? Um, well, let's go back a bit in history in the 1890s. Women uh, started biking, and it was the first time they could really, they really had control over where they went. They had freedom to go uh, and pursue work farther from the home, and they didn't have to rely on the man of the house to take them somewhere. So it was a really big moment in women's uh, freedom. Um, and they also had to wear these skirts that were about 20 pounds at the time and these corsets. But when they got on bikes, that became a little difficult. So they started wearing pantaloons, um, which are actually a huge symbol of women's rights because they could move around in them. They could walk more than 10 feet. Um, they could bike in their pantaloons. Um, and now, in 2014, biking is also a measure of freedom. If you look at this map, um, you can see that city bike trips are closely related to subway delays. 
meaning that um, if you look at the numbers, people are often to leaving a delayed subway to get on the city bike. And this is another chart designed by Jeff. Just, um, by contract, I have to mention him. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so it's another measure of freedom. It's another measure of mobility. And so that's why we want to equalize the bike ratio because this is another way for women to start getting around. This is, this is the new alternative mode of transportation in New York City, and we need to make sure everyone has access to it. So what are the pantaloons of 2014? What is going to make it easier for women to get around? Uh, safe infrastructure. Um, this is actually a bike lane in Chicago. I just really like that guy. He's very Chicago to me. <laughs> uh, as, as we saw in the previous charts and in study after study, women only bike where they feel safe. So safe infrastructure is essential. In Washington, D.C., uh, there was a study of capital bike share users and um, about twice as many women as men are biking with helmets when they use the system. That's another marker of safety. Um, system expansion. Thank you, Danny, for covering that one. Uh, <laughs> keep, it, keep it coming. Um, and bike fashion. That's another aspect that people um, are pretty focused on to make biking more appealing to women. Um, pretty helmets. And um, this is actually a really cool reflective vest, but it's also fashionable. It's better than like the fluorescent yellow vests that are functional, but not as nice to wear to a meeting. If, um, if you want more women to bike, you make it something they can show up to a meeting in. Um, but it turns out that the actual pantaloon of 2014 is city bike itself because, you know, it's, um, the research shows that women make multi-stop trips on their commutes far more than men do. So city bike is the perfect option. Um, and it's also the best active mode of transport uh, for going lo longer distances. So um, you can get in your workout on the commute. Um, in the end, city bike is something that we need to expand to outer boroughs to get more women and more diverse users on um, because it is a measure of freedom and equality in the city. Thank you. Nice. Who else? You had one that was on here, right? Okay, great. Uh, as we get Aaron's presentation, do we got one question for Sarah? Yeah. Uh, okay, we're gonna make take it from a woman. How about that? <laughs> yes, Carol. So what if um, the, the um, data that, that women are taking safer streets, what if it's not that they saw something awful that happened there, but have you thought that maybe women have eyes that assess and predict what areas look safer? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I mean, I just, that's one, one aspect is that is the kind of historic memory of something that they saw or heard about. But there is also, of course, the when I talk about truck traffic and and number of cars, you know, leans of traffic, that's a you're making a calculation in your mind to say what could happen here. Um, that's the evaluation that you're making and prediction. Love your presentation. Thank you. I love the compliments. Thank you. <laughs> And, and for those of you who came from Chicago uh, or just arrived from Chicago, <laughs> particularly Juan, uh, we, we're not picking you out or singling you out. Uh, we love Chicago. Uh, so we're happy that all the Chicagoans are here in New York. And we, could, we wish that more Chicagoans would come here uh, to New York. Uh, so next up, uh, we, we, please save your questions. We're, we're going to have, uh, Frank's actually going to host a little Q&A with people uh, trying to invigorate uh, dialogue afterward. Uh, but we now have Aaron, who's going to talk a little bit about some of his research that he's been doing with the City Bike data. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Frank, as you just heard. And uh, this is work I did as part of my Master of Urban Planning degree at Hunter College. And um, I, saw, I saw people had beat me to the punch in terms of uh, working with figuring out the routes that people were taking in the City Bike data. And the reason I'm interested in this is because 
Traffic volume is a very important input in the transportation planning process. And typically, we'll measure vehicular ATRs with these pressurized tubes that cars roll over at counts. We've all now seen that we can apply this concept to bicycles. We had a demonstration outside tonight, so thanks to Wake Count. What's ATR? The ATR is stands for automatic traffic recorder. Okay. So it's just a, a tube that records a count every time it's it's pressed, and uh, it, it works for things lighter than cars. But what we what we get out of this is essentially a point a set of point data that has volume associated with it. We don't have the entire city network with volumes on a given time of a given day. So I, what I wanted to do was use this trip data that, that was just released a few months ago from City Bike and apply it to the Lion Street network that the Department of City Planning puts out and essentially build a model and try and predict these routes and um, look at the patterns. So as we all saw before, this is just a snapshot of the CSV data. We have X and Ys for the start and ends, but no information on the routes. And I am using one month of data here. <laughs> so, so we're looking at February 2014 because I actually had the fewest trips per, of any month. And I wanted to, this is mostly proof of concept. So I wanted to, to see if it was possible for scaling it up. And basically what I'm doing is I'm building a network model. And this is all using the ArcGIS, ArcPy ecosystem, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a moment. And then I'm going to use this model to predict routes for each unique trip. So from any given start and end point, we only need to predict the route once. And then we just can apply the volume to that route. And then for every street segment, we can figure out how many routes passed over and then therefore combine all these volumes. And then we get the block level volume of estimated city bike trips. So, it's, so we, we have two inherent assumptions in this model, which obviously <laughs> neither of these can be upheld. So we're assuming cyclists always go the right way down the street. We never see any salmoning. We all know that that's never the case. And similarly, this is based on the assumption that distance is the, the sort of the ultimate metric for people choosing routes. So they're going to, rather than go out of their way to take a nice greenway or protected path, they're going to ride through whatever street in Midtown gets them wherever they're going fastest. So we, we know that both of these assumptions are never true all the time, but they, they at least give us a starting point to, to continue working off of from there. And so basically, in ArcGIS, uh, you know, pointing and clicking, you can basically build a network model. So with a definition query like this, you can limit just the streets that actually exist and are not vehicle only and meet a couple of other attributes that make it bikeable, um, so no highways. And then the street directionality is, is, is crucial in terms of making our first assumption valid. So when, all, when these streets are drawn in, uh, the from and to node is, is not actually relevant to the street direction itself, but rather the direction that the editor happened to digitize it. So this is what the Lower East Side looks like from the perspective of the digitizer. So clicking from start to end, or from and to rather. And then this is the actual um, traffic flow on these streets. You can see that they're not always the same. So you have to set up some restrictions, basically saying that in the from to direction, there's no restriction unless the attribute is A, and then the opposite direction, there is a restriction unless it has any of these three attributes, and then you can travel. And then finally, um, there's some vertical topology that we have to deal with, because as we all know, you can't just turn right off the Brooklyn Bridge onto the East River Greenway. You've got to get down to the edge of the bridge, cut, get through the street network, and you, know, you can't just immediately go from one to the other. However, if you look closely, we have some errors in our input data. So we have a Q and a D that essentially, by the rules of this model, flow is not allowed between those. So it, I wasn't getting, initially I was getting no routes over the Brooklyn Bridge because of essentially an error in the data. So I fixed those up, and, um, and once I did that, I then moved into Python. This is sort of an abstraction of the process I work with, but basically I read in the CSV data, I identified all the unique start and end stations, and then in this purple sort of black box, um, I found the best route for each unique trip and then applied those to the segments as I was explaining earlier. The downside is this took forever because I was using the ArcPy library, um, which, you know, it works. It's not very uh, efficient. So finding the best route, it, it literally took me three days to, to there's like roughly 43,000 unique trips in the month of February. So I hit start on Sunday night and it was still going on Tuesday. It hadn't crashed, so I just, I just let it keep going. It finished. And then the same thing happened with uh, selecting the street segments. So I think I read that you guys had not used the Google Maps API. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Well, I'm wrong then. No, no, no. 
Okay, well in that case, <laughs> never mind. So anyway, I, I, I wanted to basically see if this would work, and it works, just not very efficiently. Um, so this, uh, I'm not going to bore you with too many maps, but this is basically sort of like the, the bird's eye view of the results. These are average trips per day. So we see some differences in the routes that I came up with uh, versus the ones we saw earlier tonight, and that's mostly due to these assumptions I was making about how people would choose trips. And another thing I did was cut it up by uh, time of day so I could compare commuting patterns with the rest of the day. So we can see you know, some of the higher use streets sort of fluctuate throughout the day. As we saw, we you know, have more action on the Williamsburg Bridge at night than we do, say, in the AM peak. You know, not surprising there. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is really a work in progress. I'm not, I'm not done with this. I'm going to rebuild it with open source tools, hopefully get the efficiency up to a point where it doesn't take forever to run. Um, I want to use OpenStreetMap for routing. And I want to do this with a number of different assumptions, because as we all know, everyone makes different decisions when they're out on a bike. Some people follow the law all the time. Some people sometimes break the law. Some people always break the law. Other people will always go out of their way to ride in the greenway you know, if they have the time to do so. So I want to basically model all of these different possible decision-making um, elements and aggregate the results, and then that will be the point where I'm going to start doing some spatial analysis with all this and um, share the data with anyone who's interested in it. So that said, I dumped all this onto a Cardo DB map earlier today. Um, if you're interested in the link, I can send it out later. Uh, if you want to poke around and look at its current state, it's up there. You can also download from this new interface. And yeah, that's my work. Cool. So, so Aaron's got two, since he, he ended early, uh, he's, we're going we're gonna to enable two questions for Aaron. So uh, for Juan, because I know that Chicago has been unfairly picked on, uh, we'll allow Juan to, to ask the first question. So this is simulation, right? You're saying, let's look at all the point A's and point B's where people travel, and we're going to try to guess the best route in the way that Google would guess the best route, right? Uh, well, actually, yes, but no. So we're not, it's not the Google routing where it would route you towards bike facilities. So if you, if you say A and B on Google and on a cyclist, it'll direct you generally towards a bike facility. Right, I was just saying, but you're, you're doing a, a graph algorithm to find the path, right? Yeah, I'm using the network app and analysis tool so set. The, this, this is really sweet, but how do you know if those, like, from a planning standpoint, right, if you're trying to basically really estimate where this stuff is, Unlike what City Bike is doing with predicting when the stations are going to be empty or full, there's no ground truth. You don't actually know where the bikes are, so you can't compare your predictions to the reality. Right. So how do you deal with that? Like, how do you think about that when saying, hey, planners, check out my data? Well, so I, I, if, if this were to be used in the bike planning process, I think, like you said, you would need to ground truth it. So, so you know, we do have bike counts where there will be people you know, counting bikes in each direction, gender, city bike, or personal bike, and you could actually you know, verify the data before using it. But I, I agree that you, know, you wouldn't want to just use this in its current state for planning. Cool. Uh, ben. So uh, maybe you mentioned this, but if you have two points on a grid, then there's you know, n squared, whatever, ways to go from point one. Right. Maybe they're all equivalent. How does the algorithm? Well, I was, I was doing shortest route. But, the, but there's. In, is every route shot short, right? In a well, grid, in a grid. So yeah. I guess if, um, my point is, with two points, you have every route is the same length. So how, is it just random? You know what the algorithm does? I mean, yeah, it's, it's whatever the inner workings of the uh, okay. network analysis tool set in ArcGIS. Cool, great. For those of you who ask, have asked questions beforehand, I'm not ignoring you. I just wanted to make sure that those people who haven't asked questions beforehand have an opportunity to ask questions. After this particular presentation, Frank uh, is going to be up front here, helping host, talking about some insights, doing a little bit of questions of answering, kind of facilitating uh, another set of open dialogues. So if you've asked a question beforehand, just hold on. Um, we'll get to you after this. Um, so with that, I want to talk about the importance of kind of these iterative hack nights, these iterative nights. These have been uh, kind of like design dialogues, data dialogues for us to look at how to improve the system. You know, when City Bike launched, I'm sure you all read uh, articles and, and critiques and comments, and we still get them today of demonizations of cyclists, of the City Bike program. But this is really a point, an inflection point of how do we improve the safety and security of New York City? and how do we improve the infrastructure, right? How do we make it better to get around this really diverse city? 
And so here is an excellent example of MFA interaction design students who worked with City Bike to actually improve the City Bike infrastructure. So, you know, I think this is a really cool insight because what they showed and what they've demoed uh, is, is hopefully what City Bike is going to be implementing over the next year. Uh, and this is kind of like, this is a really detailed version, but we try to do these types of things every Wednesday or uh, uh, from the, the wide variety of New York City Open Data. So uh, I'm going to leave it up to Amy and Luke. Um, you're going to hear a cat meow once yeah. um, <laughs> you go over eight minutes, okay? All right, there you go. Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm Luke Stern. This I'm is Amy. Amy Wu. Uh, so, yeah, as Noah said, we are interaction design students at School of Visual Arts here in New York City. Um, I guess I'll just talk a little bit about what interaction design is to kind of frame it within kind of how this project worked. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, interaction design is a very multidisciplinary process, um, learning, you know, place within SVA. Uh, so essentially what we do is we learn about the language between for every process that happens with making something that interacts with people, whether it's like a room, a product, a chair, an app, or up to something like City Bike. So we do everything from theory to prototyping to coding to business and marketing so that we can kind of speak between all the processes that happen and be able to create a better product that gets to the needs of the user and what they want and what they actually need. So every year they do something called uh, Design for Public Space. Um, this year we were working with City Bike. Last year they did Memorial Sloan Kettering. But the idea is that we're working with a public service to help improve that in some sense. Um, this year City Bike came to us and we worked together. We wanted to kind of find a better way to access tourists that come to the city and want to use City Bike. We all know it's a great thing and that we want to use it, but it's a hard process to kind of get at the tourists that come maybe don't speak English or that don't know the city that well. So to kind of grab at them and be able to grab their attention and bring them into City Bike, make it easier for them to understand. So I guess we're just going to go through what we propose to City Bike in this semester. I'm not sure we ever thought it would be outside that class, but uh, we're going to show it to you today and I'll leave it to Amy to kind of describe that. And um, we were split up into groups, and um, we're two out of four members here, but this was our presentation that we gave to Danny. Um, so before we designed anything, we did a lot of research, um, and we conducted first-time user interviews and asked them to walk us through the experience of using City Bike for the first time. So here you have Charlie. Um, I, he, uh, direct quote, I can't <coughs> figure this out. Um, Every other word was like a profanity, trying to get through the kiosk screens and then to get an actual bike. Um, and here is me. Um, I've never used City Bike before, and so we I tested it myself. And um, I thought there were a lot of screens to go through, but I managed through it. But once I got to get a bike, um, I couldn't unlock one, and then I uh, the time the time limit. Uh, locked me out and I had to call the hotline and the hotline is super helpful um, and they helped me through that process of requesting a new code. Um, and then third was Christine. Um, she had family in town and she wanted everyone to come and use City Bike and do the touristy thing and she really liked City Bike um, but she didn't think the payment system made sense. She was very confused by the numbers. Um, so what we gathered from the, our key insights were users were frustrated by the directions on the kiosk. They were confused by the payment process. Um, they were overwhelmed by the length of the number of screens. Um, and they felt a lot of pressure um, going through the kiosk when they're a first time user and someone's behind them and they're in a hurry. Um, and they felt the screens weren't responding to their touch or they were confused by how to obtain a bike after they uh, got a bike with their credit card. Um, and so through these takeaways, we wanted to create a more intuitive interface and we wanted to reduce the number of screens as well as making um, a, a more customizable time session to cater for casual use and to enable users to purchase passes in advance um, and maybe um, to agree to terms of services beforehand before they got to the kiosk and to shorten the procedure for returning users. So we have a video to show. 
but demonstrates all our um, re are all all of our reimagined um, designs. Austin and Luke are two students visiting New York City for an extended weekend. They have some plans for their visit, but really just want to explore the city. As they are walking through Grand Central Station, they stumble upon an ad for City Bike. They hop on the subway to head to their hotel. In the subway car, they see another ad for City Bike, this time promoting the app. On the way to their hotel from the subway station, they walk by a city bike kiosk. Luke mentions to Asta that they should run a city bike when they head to the theater later that day. Upon settling into their room, they open up their laptop and check out the city bike website. The homepage banner says you can buy your tickets in advance. They click on the banner, which takes them to a screen for selecting how long they want to rent bikes for. They are able to pick from six options catering to how they wish to spend their day with their city bikes. Seeing that a single ride or a destination pass is cheaper than the subway, they decide to test it out. They select two single rides, which takes them to the checkout screen. After entering their credit card information, they are alerted that city bikes leaves all their information for one week for future purposes. After completing their order, they are instructed on how to pick up their bikes in an easy three-step video. They are also prompted to download the iPhone app. They walk back to the city bike station that they saw earlier and follow the simple procedure to get the codes for the two bikes. The kiosk prints out two receipts and they head to two available bikes and enter their individual codes. They ride up to the theater on 42nd Street and return their bikes before heading to see The Lion King. Delighted with how easy it was, they talk about getting a three-day pass, which is also known as the Weekend Getaway Pass. After the show, they decide to purchase the Weekend Getaway Pass. Luke opens up the app and follows the simple instructions to get the passes. Austin and Luke head to a kiosk nearby, pick up their new bikes, and ride into the sunset. <laughs> a week later, when they are back home in Mumbai, they receive an email from City Bus thanking them for being customers. And in the email, it shows them a map of their route. Luke smiles to Austin. Okay. Right. <laughs> So as we said, wasn't really sure that was going to kind of be shown to a group of 60 people, um, but we thought it was somewhat relevant uh, because kind of out of that came a further relationship with City Bike. And uh, I think interaction design holds a good place in this because especially within what people are talking about it, we're, we're trying to really hack kind of the user experience of City Bike, hack kind of the system that's already, already there and improving it in some way. That's eight minutes. So, um, essentially what we're trying to do is improve the information that's already within the city bike kiosk on the surface of it and make it more understandable to those who are coming to the city for the first time in the hopes that they will use it more. Great. Do we have uh, one question? Yes, sir. Um, I just want to echo um, what I think is also uh, a huge issue with um, the, the you know the daily passes versus the annual passes. Um, I think this is spot on in that it's a lot of it is related to a software issue. Speaking from personal experience, I'm um, an annual member and I use hundreds of trips a year. Uh, I, I had a brother who came in from Chicago and I tried to get him uh, a bike and tried twice for about 15 minutes and it rejected credit cards. This, my fingers were hurting trying to press the screen. It was a very, very aggravating process. And you know, I just think a lot. this calls attention to the fact that a lot of the issues of City Bike may be related to a simple software issue. So for instance, you know, if there was a more seamless process, whether it's mobile or online, 
Um, you know, just from that alone, the uh, daily and the weekly pass um, memberships would go up exponentially. That's what it seems to me. And uh, so it was interesting to hear you guys highlight that. I guess that's not Is that really a question? question. No. That's <laughs> 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 Yes. So um, I'm curious. Uh, there are some other industries where uh, the idea of having very low um, barriers to people trying something new and kind of scary uh, exist. Uh, I, I imagine things like Zipcar and other car rental services are, are a similar service. And I'm wondering whether it might be possible to share some of the insights. In bucks, maybe? Hmm? Roller coasters? Um, I, I don't know how uh, roller coasters. They're probably not quite as analogous, but uh, but uh, did, uh, when you were looking at, uh, at at improved interfaces, were you looking at, at other similar services that were trying to coax possibly scared or nervous uh, customers onto uh, onto these uh, onto this kind of platform? I don't think we looked so far outside of kind of bike programs. We looked at a lot of others around the country and worldwide. Um, to kind of get insights from those. I think often, especially with kind of those kind of services like Zipcar, you'd probably be, it would be an online process first that you'd be filling out and it'd be all these terms and services and that's kind of what we were getting at with that pre-process to the whole bike. But I mean, the real kind of challenge of City Bike is that it's those people are that are hitting the streets right away and kind of need that information directly at them when they're walking by. So it's it's you know an issue of conveying that information fast and clearly rather than Zipcar that you know you you think about it a lot and you go online you kind of read everything about it first and sign up so it's I think there are a lot of insights probably to gain from that but at, at the same time it's very different great so I guess um, we have what like 10 minutes uh, or f 15 if you want 15 okay so um, Noel thought that at this stage in the evening it was time to bring on like a like a closing oh that's mine a sort of closing picture person to handle the q a so um you know the, the q a was a little sloppy up till now i'm here to like keep things on track and get everyone out here by uh by 8 45. um i have some thoughts but i'd actually much rather like defer to the other very smart people in the room and have more hands and i guess specifically questions that are um, our presenters could handle. So we've heard a kind of interesting range of, of insights from the City Bike data, technical questions to them, or more general observations. Yes. Hold on, I'm gonna to try to get this microphone working. Is this? Which one? This one. This one. This one. This one. This one. Okay, but who had that question? I'm gonna give you the mic so that way. Uh, Mr. Chicago. How is a Divi, I mean, sorry, City Bike, uh, what's the, what, what are the strategies for getting new members and for retaining current ones? Basically, what is your job, Danny? <laughs> I, I think Danny did a, a decent job of explaining her job. Um, next question. I know, Les, do you have, do you want to respond to that? I mean, yeah, I mean, my job, honestly, um, if you read uh, Business Week, uh, Aaron Napersack really sums it up really well. Um, if you know him from Twitter, if you don't, you should follow him. He's, he's a good guy. Um, Aaron Napersack summed up my job as um, basically just sitting back and putting my feet up and like watching celebrities ride city bike and they basically <laughs> just convince all these New Yorkers to join. Um, I think that um, it's it's a challenge right like part of it is promoting the program telling good stories doing a lot of storytelling making it seem like it's something that's convenient for people making it seem like a fun option to get around making it seem for casual users we just um so we worked with the school for visual arts um this winter and i continue to work with luke and amy and they're amazing and doing a really amazing job of helping us make the information um part easy and then we also worked with not easy, but better, I guess, more well communicated to our casual members. And then uh, we had a project with the four A's, which is a big advertising association. And the students there gave us a lot of insights that I thought were like pretty good, but the judges actually gave this like amazing insight because the judges are from all these like top notch advertising firms in New York. So they're like wicked smart and they're smarter than me. And they were like, 
what you guys aren't doing. They sounded like they were from like Top Chef or something. They were like yelling at the students. And I was like, okay, I didn't know this is about. I was just going to like listen and kind of take in information. But they were like, the one thing that none of the students were suggesting is like, just convey the like the pro- value proposition here. And, the, and there was a judge, um, I think this guy Tom, and he was like, this is like the best $10 adventure that you can have in New York City. Like you can't do Jack for $10 in New York City. For $10.95, you can get a city bike day pass and you can have like a million adventures because you can take that bike so many places and do so many things with it. And he's like, that's what you're not saying. And so um, that was a really amazing insight for casual users that like, you know, I think a lot of them are tourists and look like adventure kind of tourists looking to do something different off the beaten track, get out of Times Square. Um, I think a lot of people who use the casual passes could also just be regular New Yorkers who like aren't that into bike commuting, but really want to do something different on the weekend and want to kind of like have an adventure and do something unusual for them. Like I think a lot of us take for granted, like biking isn't unusual. It's just like what we do every day, but there's lots of New Yorkers, you know, there's eight point. 5.7 million people like there's lots of people who don't do this every day and I think it's probably the same for Chicago too there's some people who are like hardcore like in the biking and there's some people who are just like oh that'd be a fun date to like take someone on Saturday afternoon so um yeah my job is that and like a million other random amazing things that I could tell you about her beers later <laughs> she also gets to listen to us and the requests that we made for data so that's an amazing part of Danny's job and she's actually listened to us which is amazing Hi, I have sort of a question challenge or uh, an observation, which is about the salmoning uh, uh, phenomenon that several people spoke about. I've heard that either in Holland or Denmark, I'm not sure which, where you know there's a lot of bike riding going on in those two countries, that what they have is on either side of practically every street, they have a two-way bike lane on either side of every street. And I just want to mention that I imagine they're doing that because they've responded to the phenomenon of human nature and that therefore they do not have salmoning in those countries or country because they recognize that that's human nature and that rather than legislating it and giving people tickets for it or whatever, but that, that they allow for it. But of course, I, I heard recently that Holland has 50% of their population are bicycle riding. We know we are a lot less than that. I am a bicycle rider. I'm one of those hardcore, everyday, personal bikes for the past 30 years. And my friend here has been doing it for at least 40 years. So we speak, we know where we speak of. We also know that there are no, there's no bike parking in front of this building yes. for people like us. Yes. I'm glad that there's the bike share, but we have to lock up to a, like a light fixture or whatever, because there's nothing. So I just want to say, do you think, my little question is, is it ever feasible? I doubt it, I'm very pessimistic, but do you think that the United States, or at least New York, will ever wake up and have that kind of dual-sided bike thing. I love the fact... All right, so everyone who says, all the pessimists, put your hands in the air. All right, all the optimists. Okay, the optimists have it. <laughs> Next question. Well, the, 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 the prospect park bike um, So I have two questions, one to the uh, sadly people and the other to the guy with the 72-hour pipe on one time. <laughs> so... Okay, I'll ask the second one first. Um, so just about the data, I was wondering, because it uses um, time, it uses time purely as I understand it, no location-based um, mapping. And so I just see a sort of maybe a perhaps flaw in this because you have those two groups, sort of the average group of bikers, and then you have the sort of faster group, but and I think you could surmise that the faster group is sounding, but how, but have you cross-referenced that with just a graph of average biking speed? Because it's entirely conceivable that there's a smaller group of hardcore bikers using city bike who just bike faster because they're better bikers. Jeff, have you correlated? No, we haven't. And part of the whole exploration was finding out if we don't find salmoning, we're going to find something else, and we just kind of want to know what the hell's going on. <laughs> and uh, to the lady, there are no bears in Holland, so that's why there's no salmoning. <laughs> no bears in Holland. And salmoning is actually a, a necessary thing for salmon, so... Right, so... I mean, if there were there no salmoning, bears. there would be no salmon. 
and, and Jeff, there are bears in Holland. You can find them in the red light district. <laughs> <laughs> Late night. I, I had a question for Danny, actually, um, about the financing of City Bike. I know that uh, bike share is kind of the mark of a world class city. Uh, you know, it means we have safe streets, it means people learn to share, it's all these great things. Um, and I know that there's a lot of different interagency collaboration that has to occur in order for these uh, systems to be successful. So the question I'm sure you've answered before, uh, Bixie filed for bankruptcy, Montreal company that manufactures the bikes. Uh, will this affect bike share in New York City? How does the financing model work? Is, you, can you do that with a hand signal from your seat? <laughs> like? Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah. 25 seconds. <laughs> the fact that Bixie went bankrupt is clearly unfortunate. It's not something you ever want to see your suppliers go bankrupt in any sort of industry. People deal with this, right? American Airlines, I'm sure, like bought parts from someone at some point and they went bankrupt and they had to figure out another supplier or they had to figure out when that supplier reorganized, are they still going to work with them? Which is, you know, what we're doing. Um, and I, you know, I think the financing model here is, uh, you know, it's obviously different than how it works in the rest of the the country. I think being so day to day in the midst of it, I just think like, how do we make this work here? And I don't think that comparing it with other places is necessarily that helpful. Like I think all of these systems that are cropping up and like, listen, bike share is still a really new industry, like all over the world is still a really new form of transportation. The subway has been around for hundred plus years. Like we're babies still, we're figuring it out. And I don't think um, for most of the cities that have done this so far, it's been really path dependent and it's been really dependent on what their public policy infrastructure was, what their physical infrastructure was, what the ecosystem of potential sponsors are and businesses that could support it. And and it's, you know, it's all been really path dependent so far. So, I mean, I would say the headline writers in New York are profiting immensely off of our system. <laughs> if you read behind the headlines and actually read the full story, which I know that, you know, with all of our New York Times app and we get the three second, you know, summary of the news these days, we don't necessarily do. City bikes doing all right. I think we're going to be around for many, many years to come. Um, but, but obviously, you know, we're we're facing challenges some of the other systems in, in the country don't. Can Can I just say, let's put this in context with the with the MTA as another public form of transport, right? The MTA commissions bus built buses to be built. The MTA commissions uh, trains to be built. So, you know, uh, and how long does it take for the MTA to commission buses and to commission trains? versus how long it took for bike share to be stood up and more or less be bought off the shelf. Is this a question? Yeah. <laughs> for, that, this is from like anyone who's, uh, the, who can explain in a comparison for uh, public transport systems in New York City, you have buses that are being built, you have trains that are being, I mean, these are commissioned, right? The trains, the subway trains that we walk into are commissioned by the MTA to be constructed, so right? write that paper. Three, so. But then in comparison with, 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 with bike share. All right, one more question. Huh. <laughs> no, I'd say five years. Five years? I would guess. Okay, and how long did it take for bike share to be put out? To, to, to be conceived and deployed? I, I mean, it depends on where you start. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it depends on where you start for either of those things, right? Like, do you start with like the person first having the idea? Anyway, I think, well, I think your question is interesting, and it would be a good topic for like a Good research paper. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, can't, I cannot summarize it in 25 seconds. All right. Other questions to the people that are standing in the back who I may have not seen? No. To the people that are sitting. Uh, so my question is, how smart are the city bikes themselves? They are so smart that they can make you toast for them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, obviously they have to know their ID number to communicate with the station, but like, what else do they know? Anything else? Can I tell you what they know? <laughs> no, I mean, they're, yes, they, we can, all the things that you see in the data are things that we are doing either from the bikes or the docs themselves. So the system itself is intelligent as to where the bikes are and where people are going. How many of the bikes have GPS systems on them? Oh. Ah, see if I tell you that. I have to look in. 
Okay. Well, that was my question. Was when enough will of them to deter theft. <laughs> enough to deter theft. One. No. <laughs> <laughs> N plus one, right? Okay. Um, the IDs given to the, the city bike data are not the same as the IDs on the bikes. Yes. Was, that a, was that a privacy issue? Um, I, I'm just a marketing person. <laughs> I can't really answer too many questions. We have um, two ways of tracking the bikes, and I actually can't even explain to you why. There's a chain stay number, and then there's also a thing called the Y number that if you like really wanted to get down and dirty and find, you can see it's underneath the seats. It's not a secret. Um, I, I don't know why we have both ways. I can't. I, I, can, I, can, I can look into that. Um, good question, maybe. I'll look into it. I want to know the actual number on the busiest city bike. I had a serial number. But oh, to find. People were like, there it is, if you're yeah. cooler. Yeah, because we had a conversation about finding the top 10. Uh, right, right. They don't want to see it. Pictures and hugging. You can't. <laughs> 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 well, if you want to hug them, I'll tell <laughs> um, Frank, do you, do you want to also go back there and kind of explain the thing, the counting machine? Yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. um, so OK, so this. this this concludes the Q&A to our wonderful speakers, so let's thank them for all their contributions tonight. And, and super briefly, at the back of the room, there is a large uh, object on a tripod. It is a bike counter. Uh, so if you biked up Lafayette Street on your way here, you might have ridden over it. And had you ridden over it, the number on the display would have gone up by one. It is a community-owned bike counter. It was crowdfunded by people in the city, and it's available for any community organization to borrow to count bikes in a visible way. So if you're interested in using biking and bike data as a form of community advocacy, please talk to us about using it. You can go to planningcore.org to find out, or you can talk to me or other Planning Corps or Tomorrow Lab people who are here who maybe could stick up their hands. Raise, raise those hands, hi. Uh, we would love to see it used for, for data collection projects. As you can see, it has a really big visible screen and that is not an accident. It's intended to be something that you can't miss as you bike over it or walk past it. Um, we're going to be there. Come and jump up and down on the pneumatic tube and we'll tell you how it works. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you, Frank. And, and from, from the Beta NYC group, uh, I hope to see you either on Friday for drinking up with some of the city's uh, city employees and other uh, civic enthusiasts, civic data and open government enthusiasts. Otherwise, we'll see you on Saturday at City Camp NYC. And for closing words, our hostess this evening. Thank you everyone for coming. Our next Rudin event will be most likely this fall for our Short Talks Big Ideas series. Uh, five minute lightning talks on innovative ideas and projects in, in transportation. So if you have something to submit, you would like to speak, come up and see me. Thank you. Thank you.